All right. Well, welcome everyone to Layer 1. I know uh, you guys are probably coming back from your lunchtime food comas. But uh, my name is uh, John, or a lot of you know me as Arclight. I know I decided to be all bold and use my real name here. You know, this presentation is uh, kind of a scandalous, shady thing to do. So uh, today, we're going to talk about access control systems. And uh, by access controls, I mean physical security controls, uh, like these RFID cards where we're all been issued to get into our rooms. Possibly a poor choice in the Marriott's part, I don't know. <laughs> so uh, what we're going to do is sort of go through this. Um, we, had this uh, we did this exercise over a period of about 18 months. Uh, we run the 23B shop, Hackerspace. So it's, uh, a lot of y'all are going to come down there tomorrow maybe for a party. Uh, but we got tired of dealing with metal keys, and we started looking into uh, you know, researching uh, an electronic access system and realized that there were uh, kind of a lot of things wrong with that from a hacker's pr perspective. So for starters, uh, you know, why are we doing this? So uh, security and access control systems, they're mostly closed source and very proprietary. Uh, we really had a hard time getting much usable information from any of the vendors. Uh, very little of the information about their inner workings is published. Uh, some of them publish a little bit about their external protocols. Uh, there are some NEMA, some IEEE standards, and an alarm manufacturer standard for uh, eliminating false alarms and a few things and ANSI stuff, but that's really about it. You know, some of them even have their chip numbers scrubbed off and you know their ROMs with the fuses blown, so you can't read anything out of them. Uh, we need an access control system. Uh, we basically got tired of dealing with keys and having to sometimes let the landlord in, you know, not being able to revoke keys if we gave one out for somebody. So you know, we decided we want electronic access controls, and we want something that we owned that you know we could prove how secure or insecure it was and we would be able to modify it. So in order to, to really get there, I think it helps to start by defining what we mean by security in this case. So this is the classic uh, Bruce Schneier or Ross Anderson security engineering uh, triangle. You know, security defined in terms of assets. In our case, we're not talking necessarily electronic assets, data, but we're talking about people, we're talking about our facility, our stuff, maybe our information inside there, maybe our server room. We're talking about threats to those assets, threat actors, actual people who intentionally want to get to you, harm your stuff, uh, vandalism, uh, theft, you know, all those sorts of things. And then we're talking about countermeasures, you know, things we can wrap around those assets to provide some sort of mitigation of those threats. And uh, important differentiation, uh, safety and security are related, but they're not the same thing. Security is typically the countermeasures you install to mitigate intentionally uh, harmful threats, where safety, uh, that more encompasses things like, uh, you know, s human error and, and natural disasters, but they affect each other, and sometimes uh, doing things like adding safety systems increases security and vice versa. <clears throat> One other thing to consider, uh, all of these things have trade-offs. Uh, we talk cost, convenience, and we have things like the creation of new vulnerabilities. We're all familiar with that maybe from doing you know, web security and network security. But when you're talking about things like uh, making sure you can exit your building in case of a fire, it kind of acquires a new dimension. So we have, to, you know, we have to look at that. Things that are open the doors, let's say an emergency, you know, shouldn't be able to be easily subverted to open it for a, you know, an attacker. So there's something kind of interesting. Uh, <clears throat> Ross Anderson, uh, Security Engineering, it's a great book. He has a, a good section about physical security, and he really kind of formulates it. Uh, there's a f kind of a four-sided uh, square, four-sided figure. Uh, the four things you can basically do with physical security devices and, and countermeasures. Uh, you can't stop anyone from getting into your stuff or your facility. That's just not going to happen. The four things you can do, though, are deter them. You can delay your attacker. You can detect an attack. Uh, after it's already in progress or being attempted, and you can mount some sort of response to it. And that response could be anything from uh, communicating with your attacker with an intercom, setting off a siren, calling the police, uh, you know, paging the guard desk, anything like that. So fundamentally, these are all there to enforce uh, a security policy. <clears throat> and that security policy is something that you have to decide for yourself you know, whether it's your apartment, your hacker space, your corporate high-rise, uh, you know, what are the priorities and what are you really trying to get out of this? 
just like an enterprise uh, IT security policy is necessary before you start buying firewalls, uh, you need to figure out what procedures you want to be enforced by your, your access controls. And uh, some pretty fundamental ones that come up over and over, security and safety of the personnel. Uh, any kind of security measure you put in that does not protect the people who actually work in the building, you know, give them something, uh, they're not going to follow. They're going to prop the door open or they're not going to care because, you know, it, it's apparent that their safety isn't uh, first and foremost in mind. Prevention of theft or damage to your assets, uh, that's a big one. And auditing of access and security events. Uh, that sort of stuff falls back into deterrence as well as response. It lets you mount a response after the fact, maybe prosecute someone, uh, maybe find a vulnerability that you wouldn't have from the logs. And, uh, you know, when we talk about threats, uh, something that's kind of interesting, uh, there is a model developed that's in uh, some of the security textbooks. It came from an army officer. They don't cite the name. Uh, but they basically come up with four model attackers. And this is something I haven't seen. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, we have model attackers in the room, but, you know, they all fit the same old black shirts, uh, kind of shady looking. Uh, <laughs> this is a little more formal. Uh, what they did is they came up with these four arbitrary guys. And uh, I say guys, but uh, that's, what, that's what they did. Uh, we have Derek, Charlie, Bruno, and Abdurman. And these guys sort of represent uh, a spectrum of, of different threats, you know, physical threats to a uh, facility or, or some assets. And uh, the first one, uh, this is probably the, the biggest one we had in mind with our, you know, hackerspace security system, uh, Derek. Uh, Derek is a 19-year-old addict. He's looking for a low-risk opportunity to steal something he can sell for his next fix. Uh, rather fitting, because we're also one block away from a methadone clinic. <laughs> yeah. Hackerspace real estate isn't always the most prime. <laughs> so our next one, we have Charlie. Uh, Charlie is a 40-year-old inadequate with seven convictions for burglary. He spent 17 of the last 25 years in prison. This is like your classic career con. Uh, although not very intelligent, he's cunning and experienced, He's picked up a lot of lore during his spells inside. He steals from small shops and suburban houses, taking what he can to sell to local fences. And this is a guy who, uh, you know, may do a smash and grab or might be someone who has access to some more sophisticated things, some tools. Maybe he can do some lock picking or lock bumping. Uh, you know, it, some of the things that, you know, you might see in a residential or commercial burglary, you know, repeated over and over. And then we have this one. Uh, this is kind of interesting. Uh, Bruno. Uh, Bruno is a gentleman criminal. His business is mostly stealing art. As a cover, he runs a small art gallery. He has a forged university degree in art history and one conviction for robbery 18 years ago. After two years in jail, he changed his name and moved to a different part of the country. He has done occasional black bag jobs for intelligence agencies who know his past. He'd like to get into cybercrime, but most he's done so far is stripping 100K worth of memory chips from a university's PCs in the mid-90s when there was a memory famine. And then our last one, uh, this is some, you know, the kind of uh, you know, elusive threat that's always in the news but you never seem to see, uh, Abdurman. And Abdurman heads a cell of a dozen militants, most with military training. They have infantry weapons and explosives with PhD grade technical support provided by a disreputable country. A German himself came out third in a class of 280 at the military academy of that country, but was not promoted because he's from the wrong ethnic group. He thinks of himself as a good man rather than a bad man, and his mission is to steal plutonium. So clearly we have different kinds of threat actors. Uh, we don't really worry about the last one. That's the military's problem. Uh, really, it's sophisticated controls wrapped around lots of mass, you know, things like concrete barriers that stop trucks and explosives and, uh, you know, detachments of Marines with guns who come and kill those people. And the first one, uh, you know, the second one, those are the problems of criminologists and sociologists and so forth. So we really are kind of worried about uh, Bruno. He sort of fits in the, uh, uh, <coughs> the upper end of off-the-shelf criminals. Uh, that's what we design things like data centers and higher security installations around. Uh, but we probably don't design every business around that. So, uh, I travel to a lot of businesses and, uh, you know, we talk about enterprise security and things like that, and I've kind of made some observations. Uh, your typical business perimeter is protected by your standard five to seven pin mortise lock from Schlage, Yale, Sargent, et cetera, uh, tempered glass windows, an alarm system. 
uh, typical kinds of stuff we see. Uh, larger sites have electronic perimeter access controls often, and they're in many cases tied into building systems like HVAC and lighting and, and maybe an on-site security desk that monitors it all. And the physical uh, mechanical locks they have are usually higher grade like Best and you know, Medico and some of those brands, uh, mostly for key control and, and the ability to master a key a little bit more safely. Uh, this kind of thing it represents good basic protection from burglary, uh, it meets insurance requirements, and uh, the Derek and Charlie threat models are probably covered fairly well here. Uh, data centers, uh, high value uh, merchandise handling facilities, those are geared more towards the Bruno attacker where you have things like defense in depth, you know, layered security, not just a perimeter, a more robust uh, detection response maybe with uh, you know, armed uh, security uh, from a security company that you know, has very rigid protocols for you know, not taking no for an answer if they call back and, and things like that. Uh, so some of the typical features of these, uh, you know, looking into these, we uh, took apart uh, old alarm systems and access controls and we uh, you know, looked at existing installations where people gave us permission. And we typically have uh, modules that control one to four doors, uh, little black boxes on the wall here and there. Uh, we have a centralized, usually Windows platform computer uh, that stores the access token information and keep logs. Uh, they typically push out policies. They, usually you can access the, the doors and so forth without that system being on. You know, it, it stores it locally in case that thing goes down. Uh, we usually have uh, some sort of access device. Uh, you're talking you know, where the rubber meets the road. Uh, an electrical signal between 5 and 48 volts is what's going to open your door. Uh, it's typically an electromechanical device. <coughs> uh, things like an electric mortise lock, which we have one here, I'll, I'll show you. Uh, door magnets, uh, we'll have some pictures of those. And you've probably seen those a lot of places. They're a big heavy duty electromagnet that holds the door shut. Electric strikes, if you ever get buzzed into a pawn shop or somewhere like that and you hear that horrible sound, that's usually an AC operated electric strike. Uh, all the stuff is, that we're doing is basically ending in uh, closing some kind of relay and uh, energizing a, a device that was invented in about 1910. Gotta love it. Uh, the access and token readers, uh, early systems use things like plain pin pads and they used uh, you know, physical keys that turned a switch. And uh, you know, now we're looking at more things like uh, cards, it could be Magstripe, contact cards, smart cards, uh, contact lists, uh, RFID cards, that sort of thing. Uh, EM4100, those are cheap uh, open standards, RFID cards are used in less expensive systems. Um, the HID systems are basically a, a slightly extended uh, protocol with a few more bits, at least on their lower end. Uh, MyFair, Indala, some of those brands are able to do things like read and write uh, data and you know, do a little bit more stuff. Uh, some important things, almost every facility has some sort of device that gives anyone a free exit. Uh, there might be a push to exit in the appropriate local language, you know, maybe it's lit up. Uh, they often have motion detectors, actually usually both. Uh, in fact, usually the push to exit physically applies or interrupts power so that if all that electronics is not working, you're still able to get out. Uh, sometimes they have a button that you push it and a, a little egg timer goes off for, you know, counts down 30 seconds and lets you out to make it inconvenient so that you don't use that as a, your main means of getting in and out. Uh, they may have integration with some centralized console application where uh, security cameras can follow uh, the events. You know, uh, the camera comes up immediately in the loading dock. If a motion detector goes off saying that there's a truck there or someone pushed a button to the intercom. Uh, most facilities have the capability of doing a remote lock, unlock. It could be something dumb like go to my PC, managing that Windows PC. Uh, that's kind of scary, but that does control physical access sometimes. Uh, you do have things like, uh, like a guard console that you know, they can verify that you're at the right door with a camera and then let you in to the loading dock without having to you know, leave and, and go track the guy down and, and open the door. Uh, and then integration with the alarms, anything from uh, just you know, triggering a, a contact to you know, full IT level integration. Uh, so I, I went ahead and made a little diagram, kind of shows how those work. In a bigger facility, you'll typically have the access servers in some sort of database uh, in, the, in a server room. And that's, uh, they're basically just answering you know, SQL requests and some kind of uh, front-end software. 
Uh, they could be clustered or not. Uh, typically, management PC and the smaller systems, the management PC is also the database and the policy pusher. Uh, we have things like uh, you know, HVAC and alarm systems. Uh, a lot of the, the newer ones have Ethernet built in and the ability to, to communicate with these things. Sometimes there are uh, integration software companies that tie it all together with a PC application. Uh, and we look in the lower left-hand corner, uh, those little panels, uh, sometimes they come as bare boards, the cheaper ones do. A lot of times they're a little uh, sheet metal box that the electrician screws to the wall in a, in a closet somewhere, hopefully one that locks. Uh, they have a UPS, because you don't want to get denied access to your space if the power is out. Uh, they typically have a, a simple microcontroller. It could be a, you know, an Atmel or a PIC or you know, some other type of CPU. And then some kind of network capability. The older ones are RS-422, basically a fancy serial port that uh, goes over long ranges. Uh, newer ones are all starting to be Ethernet based. <coughs> and those doors, they have a few elements. Um, they have things like an access reader. You know, it could be a pin pad, a scramble pad, where you know, it's a fancy pin pad that's harder to shoulder surf. Uh, you know, some type of token reader, so something you have. It could be a biometric, which is basically taking your fingerprint and something that it thinks is your fingerprint and giving you some numbers that compares against the database. Uh, typically a local copy of that cached there and then you know, requests uh, further can go back to the access server. Uh, and then they have uh, what they call a rec sensor. That's request to exit, basically a, a button or sensor or both that let you out, uh, regardless of you know, what state the door is in and, and so forth. Uh, and then they typically have a sensor on each side to see if someone's actually there. And uh, sometimes that, those decisions are handled locally, and sometimes they go back to the panel. Uh, but in any case, there's almost always a mechanical override or, or some sort of way of getting people uh, access through that door, at least in the exit direction. Uh, the systems that do block your physical path to exit and don't have an easy mechanical way of opening uh, usually have to have something like a, uh, an integration with the alarm system, uh, fire controls, things like that so that they can uh, get a signal to release all the exterior doors, let's say, in the event of an emergency. Uh, something that, you know, needed for safety codes, NFPA has, I think they call their part 101 that governs that, uh, but also something that can be subverted by an attacker. Uh, again, all our newer systems, they're going to have an Ethernet network, uh, preferably a good secure one, but if it's installed by a, an electrical vendor, it may just be, you know, some, some done Netgear hubs and, and that sort of thing. So. <coughs> We can talk about the threat model a little bit. You know, we talked about some attackers. Um, you know, what are advantages and disadvantages of these electronic locks? Uh, the first and foremost one, the business problem they really solve, uh, it's easy to revoke the keys. Uh, the keys are cheap, they are disposable, usually, and you can give, and, you know, give them and you can electronically uh, revoke them without any real financial penalty. Obviously hard to do with metal keys. Uh, you can have very flexible security policies. Uh, you can make a, your, your front door or any door in your facility or any space accessible only in the context of a certain uh, time of day or week or month. Uh, your physical location in the facility, security level that you know, is assigned to you, security policy. Uh, you can have public and private areas uh, with different policies wrapped around them. Uh, you can have, for instance, alarm sensors everywhere, but you can choose to not alarm but only log if it's, say, uh, a lobby during business hours. You can maybe uh, have it make a decision, just like you would analyze logs and do uh, an intrusion detection uh, system for, for IT security. You know, you could determine if someone's there in a certain hours that they aren't supposed to be there. You can, you know, raise an alarm, do things like that. Uh, Public spaces often become private spaces, you know, on the weekends or after hours, that sort of thing. Uh, one nice thing, it, it can, uh, can be a good hedge against carelessness. So it can do things like, uh, you know, allow the, the front doors to always be locked, uh, even if, you know, people are there and so forth, because you can make it very convenient to swipe in and out and unlock it. Whereas in the system you might have had before with, mechan with mechanical locks and and metal keys, those are going to be uh, just something that always gets left propped open and you know left unlocked. And you can also use uh, alarms and things to discourage that. And the last thing that's really important that you don't have with mechanical devices, uh, you can audit it. You can know not necessarily who, but at least you know what token was presented or what alleged user accessed what and where. 
and what path they took through it if you comb through the logs. And finally, uh, a lot of your stuff, uh, you know, anything from lighting to alarms to air conditioners, uh, they can all be tied into this. Uh, Ethernet and dry contacts where you just have an on-off uh, relay or, you know, sensor. Uh, you can do things like turn the air conditioning on or turn the lights on ahead of someone coming into the facility so that, you know, their security is actually improved uh, by having, you know, their path lit and, you know, through the parking lot or through the space. And you're also saving energy and, you know, making things more convenient. <coughs> so let's talk about the disadvantages of electronic locks. Uh, you know, we're kind of here to, to think about, you know, security measures in terms of, you know, how can I break this, right? We're all hackers. So RFID, right, that's been, uh, you know, big in the news. It's been big everywhere. Uh, I know a lot of you people I've seen in the audience uh, probably built the Proxmark. It's like a, a Swiss Army knife that can decode and even emulate these cards. Uh, you know, wh what do these cards do, right? If we, you know, fundamentally look at it, it's a little radio antenna with a chip on it. And when you put it up to a reader, it can be interrogated uh, without having to necessarily touch it. And it can spit back an ID or it can make some sort of transaction where data is stored and, and rewritten or a challenge response is done or something like that. Uh, and they're designed to be basically used like a credit card at contact distances. And it's assumed also that you know, they aren't going to be readily cloned. Well, it turns out we know that's not exactly the case, right? Uh, a physical key can be cloned, you know, if you get physical access to it and you're able to, you have a key machine or access to a locksmith. Uh, it can even be done with a high-res photo. Uh, that was proven in a paper in 2008. Uh, but these RFID cards, you know, they have some problems. Um, you know, uh, this technology is really only meant to be read from a few centimeters away, but depending on the system, uh, you can build larger coils and uh, power them up with more power. And you can uh, do something like, uh, you know, read an RFID card from a foot away or even five feet away, possibly. If you ever walk through a shopping center that has the anti-shoplifting tags, uh, that big plastic uh, stanchion in the middle of the aisle is uh, a box full of big coils that are maybe 15 centimeters across, and there might be 30 of them. And they will pick up <coughs> those low-frequency tags that are on your goods and alarm if you bring one out. Well, that sort of thing can be adapted to read RFID cards in an unauthorized way. Uh, so we like to say, if it can be read, you should just assume it can be cloned. Uh, if we you know, accept the premise that these are just chips, uh, they can be emulated with software. And we have some very fast microprocessors and microcontrollers that can basically bit bang out any type of signal you want. <coughs> Another disadvantage, uh, they require electricity. And in requiring electricity, uh, you know, we, we have some interesting new problems that come in. Uh, for one thing, power can be interrupted or can be manipulated. Like we can do things such as uh, analyze the power going to a device and maybe deduce whether it's sending zeros and ones or processing something or possibly get to spit out its key. Uh, we might be able to short it out and interrupt its power and deny use of that reader or that door. We might be able to, if the system is poorly designed, get the door to open uh, by applying a high voltage or uh, drawing down the load and making it brown out, different things like that. Uh, unlike a physical lock where basically those tumblers and, and metal bits moving around are governed by physics, uh, this is something that if you can control the power going to it, you may be able to do unintentional things with it. And finally, they might uh, fail in an unpredictable way. You know, a door lock is probably just going to break if it's vandalized or abused too hard. But you don't exactly know what an electronic device with a few thousand lines of code you didn't write is going to do when you uh, possibly push it to fail. And another thing, uh, if you want to try out, let's say, every Medeco key there is, it might take you a year of sitting there with tryout keys, even if the tolerance is a little sloppy. But in a poorly designed system, you might be able to hook up a device or a widget that can uh, basically let you uh, try all those in you know, seconds or minutes. Now, its strength is also in that because it's software-based, uh, it can you know, have uh, countermeasures uh, to that, uh, but it's certainly a real attack that's possible. And finally, you are depending on the security of everything in there from the physical layer through the network uh, in order to get that signal safely to uh, wherever the, it's authorized, uh, your token's gonna be authorized and back, and that authorization signal the same way. 
can be good or bad. So with all that in mind, you know, we uh, <laughs> set about designing a, an access system that we could use to research these issues and that we could use for our space. So we came up with some criteria. Uh, first, we felt that relevance to the Derek and Charlie attackers made sense. And really, our main goal was keeping the junkies from our alley out of the shop. Uh, the original uh, door control was a Schlage deadbolt with five pins. So we figured if we can beat that uh, as a security target, we're at least better off than we started. Uh, resistance to a more sophisticated attacker always a plus. Sorry? So we need to control two doors. Uh, most spaces are you know, smaller places have a couple of uh, spaces, maybe a you know, front and back door. We felt that was a good starting point. Uh, when we get to something with lots of doors and, and so forth, we're probably looking at something that's going to be multi-tiered and have those distributed modules anyway. Uh, we like the idea of being compatible with off-the-shelf readers. So we've seen a few RFID projects. Uh, the uh, DOS labor space in uh, Germany, I believe, uh, did some very interesting uh, homemade readers and uh, poured a crypto code and you know, hand wound the coils and made some, some really neat devices. Uh, the problem is, though, we felt that would be a little bit hard to replicate. We'd prefer to get something that's low cost and off the shelf so that other people could you know, pick this up and hack on it. And uh, the other thing that kept coming up uh, there were people that got some really fancy, interesting widget like a Hearst scramble pad or some type of retinal scan or other biometric that was surplus that got you know, discarded from a renovation of some high security facility and they figure out how to make it work. That's great, but if someone else were to try and pick that up, they'd be $5,000 each new you know, just for the, the system with no manual. So we thought that wasn't really as relevant. We preferred something you could get either used on eBay as a commodity or new from you know, pick your knockoff vendor. Uh, we like the idea of being able to run independent of a PC or other you know, server. Uh, anything with a real OS has more ways to attack it. It has millions of lines of code you didn't write. And uh, if we divide it into what we call hard and soft tasks, hard tasks mean things like opening and closing the doors, and soft tasks mean things like connecting to the internet, which require a lot more sophistication. Uh, we'd rather the soft tasks be allowed to fail and not affect the hard tasks like leaving the front door open kind of a basic embedded systems uh, philosophy that the dumb device is the master and the smart device is a peripheral. And uh, of course we want to do uh, logging and auditing. Uh, you know, that was debatable whether it could be internal with a flashcard or PC based. Turns out we can do both. Uh, and we want to have alarm and sensor capability, you know, be able to detect occupancy so we know when someone's there, uh, have, you know, maybe four or more alarm zones for you know, alarm and occupancy detection and request to exit, things like that. And we also like the idea of being able to integrate with uh, existing alarm system, you know, with a contact, so forth, so that we have some redundancy and defense in depth. So we came up with a methodology. Uh, <coughs> you know, we we uh, decided to, uh, to start with the Arduino. It's a microcontroller that, you know, kind of lowest common denominator, ground floor for embedded systems. And, uh, you know, it appeared to have enough I.O. ports and, uh, and processing power and storage to do this. Uh, we want to have uh, you know, time and date security policies uh, possible to implement. Multiple security levels uh, need to be very physically robust. Uh, battery backup, uh, protection against reverse polarity and high voltages and all those sorts of nasty things that happen in the wild as opposed to in your breadboard. Uh, we want to be low cost. So open standards tokens and readers, uh, adaptable to new stuff. Uh, something we could build for maybe $100 or less. Uh, commercial systems, uh, there are a few, you know, China knockoffs, but most of them you're looking at 1000 to $3,000 per door to electrify. So, you know, that's kind of out of the, the budget of your starving hacker. And we want something that was repeatable. Uh, you know, only commodity components you can get through DigiKey or Element 14 or Mauser or, God forbid, Radio Shack. I mean, Cell Phone Shack. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, we took all those, those constraints in mind and, you know, started designing something. Uh, we put on a breadboard and we started testing some, you know, free code we found for interfacing to some of the readers and, and that stuff. Uh, we had to do a little bit of debugging. Uh, there's something called the Wigan Protocol, which is uh, Wigan or Wigan, I don't know. Uh, Zach Franken actually did a, a talk here in 2007 about how to intercept that and replay the, the tokens and so forth. 
Uh, but between that and some manufacturer's data sheets, we figured out how, you know, how that works and we got some code together. Uh, we built a 1.0 version of the circuit board. We put some basic input, input protection and uh, a UPS power supply on there. Uh, we found uh, some RFID cards that are used very uh, successfully in industry for you know, things like cattle tracking and goods and you know, things like that. Uh, they are available in keychain and uh, swipe card format. It's called EM4100. Some are rewritable, some are read-only. Uh, so we got some, our hands on some of those readers and you know, the tokens were less than a dollar, so affordable to play with and cut them up and so forth. And we assembled it all on a piece of plywood and called it version 1.0. So this is it. Uh, there's a power supply that's not very efficient on top with the UPS and a big honking battery. There's a couple pieces of door hardware. There's a, a door magnet on the bottom. Uh, there's our board in the middle, or just up from it. And then there's a couple of readers, uh, a mullion reader, uh, which is basically designed to go on a, a basically the, the, the door jam edge next to a front door. And then there is a, uh, an, an interior reader that has a pin pad, so we can you know, use two-factor authentication or uh, send some commands, that sort of thing. And so we sort of treated this like it was the front door. So every time someone would come in, you know, we would swipe in and out and test it and try to break it, find out all of its flaws. And we uh, used that with a homemade PCB that we didn't spend much money on and kind of refined it. Uh, we found out some things like the Arduino uh, Ethernet module ha takes a lot of power and can burn up the regulator on board some of them. So we made a nice one amp switching power supply and put that on board. Uh, we decided to make it carry you know, five amps uh, continuous current for some of the heavy duty high security door hardware you can get. Put in more protection in the inputs, made it harder to reset and brown out and all those sorts of things and we sent off a, uh, a PCB to get created. And uh, we went ahead and uh, built in some capability where it can store 200 local users, uh, 255 security levels, uh, added a console you can control via ethernet, and uh, or rather uh, via serial, but it can also be serial over ethernet. And uh, we integrated alarm and access functions and tested the snot out of them, and of course some self-testing routines. And this was the result. <coughs> so. This is our first uh, you know, commercially produced. It's uh, kind of big for an Arduino shield. It's about six Arduinos worth. And it's got some big relays and a switching power supply in the middle. That's that. Uh, input protection with uh, surge protectors, MOVs. It's got big screw terminals. Uh, it's got some Darlington transistor arrays. A lot of this is stuff we copied from uh, 1980s alarm panels. We figured uh, you know, that's something that's been used and abused for 20 years. So they uh, probably were doing something right. Uh, and then we put a real-time clock on board, uh, something Arduino doesn't have. And we opto-isolated everything, so there's no direct connection into that micro. So its little world is you know, hopefully uh, sandwiched away where you know, bad people can't get to it as easily. And uh, you know, we, uh, we test with that, and we are now at our, I guess we call our 2.11. And we have a, a basic piece of hardware that supports two readers supports any of the compatible Arduinos. Uh, we tested with the Freeduino and the Seed and a lot of those. Uh, it's interrupt driven, very responsive on the, the reads. Uh, <coughs> uh, it does have uh, remote monitoring capability. Uh, we're using just serial to a small Linux PC now. Uh, we looked into using the Arduino Ethernet and it has a lot of issues. Uh, it's single threaded and it, it doesn't respond very well when uh, let's say your host hangs up and you know, needs a full 30 seconds to time out. And during that time, your front door is open. Not so good. Okay. So the hard and soft task, we figured that should just be offloaded to a, a wall wart, you know, Linux PC or an embedded device of some kind. And uh, you know, we uh, kind of fine-tuned the uh, remote administration, uh, put in a, a console password, and you know, three strikes you're out for an hour and things like that. And we published the EagleCAD files and the Arduino code and packaged it all up. And then we decided to eat our own dog food. We uh, put it in production. And we secured some do uh, commercial door hardware, which is pretty expensive, uh, it turns out. Uh, if you have a storefront type building anywhere in the US, it's probably equipped with an Adams Wright uh, uh, aluminum uh, mortise lock. And they're the only game in town, and they want $300 and up for their stuff. Uh, residential doors, there are some, some cheats for that. You can hack those uh, little Schlage uh, keypads and stuff to, to just be a dumb uh, solenoid for the door. Uh, but we programmed it up and uh, installed it in an old alarm enclosure we gutted and put a big honking battery, you know, the big honking battery from before in there. 
and uh, a little UPS circuit and a nice five amp power supply that's, you know, mil spec. And we started putting in here and plumbing up all the stuff. And uh, it's, it's worked out pretty well. Uh, we found uh, about a dozen major bugs the first week we had it in production, including one that would let you uh, uh, enter any arbitrary command after a successful uh, swipe, even if you were not the right person. Some stuff like that you don't really find until you live with it. And we installed all this nice hardware, put a little bit higher security locked uh, than that, uh, that Schlage, you know, five pin that was in there before. And, uh, you know, we have a, a couple options. Uh, some of our doors, this is at another site. Uh, this is a, a magnet lock with, with two magnets and a request exit reader. Uh, this is one we installed at another door. This is your door magnet. It's a, about a 1,200 pound uh, pull magnet. It only takes about 200 milliamps to keep it shut. And then there's a Bosch exit reader. You see this thing over and over. Uh, if you do see one of those in the wild, by the way, you can pull that cover off and you can do things like change the pattern that it, uh, that it picks up from and make it more permissive. You can set the sensitivity to be higher so that things like waving a sheet of paper through the door crack will let you in. Something to think about. <coughs> so in doing all this, we started finding some vulnerabilities. This is really why we're here, right? Uh, first of all, the wiring. Wiring is absolutely vulnerable in any of these systems. A few of them do have full challenge response uh, capability and you know, encryption between the, you know, the, all the devices and, and the, the brain or the, you know, the authentication panel or the access server, but most of them don't. So you can do things like man in the middle, that Wigan protocol. You can have a device that stores and replays successful swipes. You can short out the low voltage wiring that controls the solenoids. Uh, in some cases, if it's not designed well, you might be able to blow a fuse and have a fail, uh, not a fail secure, but a fail safe door open. That uh, device right there, that door magnet, when you interrupt power to it, it opens no matter what. So if you can attack the wiring, you can you know, blow a fuse or you can cut a wire somewhere, you're in. Uh, we also found something else interesting. <laughs> uh, some of these devices have a a little uh, one or two wires that are grounded uh, to indicate a green LED, a successful swipe, or a little chirp that you, you got in. Well, some of those are tied into the same relays that control the doors. And if you can backfeed that, you can supply your own 12 volts, or you can short it to the power to the reader, uh, they might backfeed that door hardware and let you in. So something interesting. And we also figured out that the alarm sensors uh, if they, most of our alarm systems are pretty good. They have uh, usually a resistor in there somewhere. If you were to either short out the wires or cut them, both of those will trigger an alarm. But some cheaper systems that just use digital pins, uh, you might be able to just short out the uh, alarm wiring and uh, have it improperly read that the door is closed when it's really open, that sort of thing. And we also figured out another nasty attack that's probably feasible on any of these is applying high voltage, something like a stun gun or plugging into 110, uh, probably will just blow up um, you know, a component and just disable that reader. But you don't know if they don't have good surge protection, like fast TVS transient suppression diodes and MOVs and stuff. Uh, if that can get on the power bus and into the microcontroller, uh, you might be able to cause something unpredictable to happen, like a, you know, a register to get set high that opens the door. Uh, it's not predictable, but it could happen. <laughs> now, the tokens themselves, the readers, uh, we discovered that, uh, you know, of course, anything that you contact physically, it's vulnerable to vandalism, to being, you know, unscrewed from the wall and manipulated. Uh, you can obviously, you know, vandalize it or cut wires and do denial of service. Uh, of course, you can clone RFID and other tokens. Uh, you may be able to do replay attacks. And skimmers are a valid threat. Uh, that's something that actually could be totally passive. You could have a little overlay that's powered by the, the field that powers up RFID cards when they're present. And you can use that to you know, maybe power a skimmer and, and store those, those tokens. And you can, even, you can use the reader's own field. Uh, we also discovered that most of these readers have no collision protection. So meaning if you have two or more tokens physically within range, it can't read either of them. Or it may read the first one and then go into like a, a lock state where it won't accept a second read. So you could glue down a, an old token conceivably and deny access to that reader. Interesting things like that. 
Also, you know, we alluded to this before, but very few systems have any kind of protocol security. It's clock and data or weekend or serial data. You know, really not anything that can't be trivially spoofed, replayed, intercepted, you know, passively or actively. Uh, the systems that do have this are usually used for things like uh, transit tokens, security, uh, you know, secure payment systems. Even the ones like the mobile speed pass that have encryption you know, have had papers published where they're alleged to have been broken. So I don't think anything that relies on a master key, something like that, should really be you know, considered secure. Uh, some of these access tokens, uh, they all come in different formats. You know, they have key fobs, they have implantable chips, uh, that's the lower left-hand corner, uh, wallet cards. Uh, typically, the larger the device, the longer the range it can be intercepted at. So the small devices have actually some additional security in that they don't work very well at long distances. Harder to, to power them up and, and get them to read. Uh, the, the classic HID token everyone has, this is actually very similar to these knockoff uh, RFID chips that are used for industrial applications. Uh, but it has, a, instead of 26 bits, maybe 34 bits in the key. Uh, but they're very similar um, interception technique. Uh, so the physical hardware, uh, we also found there's some things you can do, like those door magnets. Uh, typically, they're stronger than the door frames themselves. But uh, it turns out that putting a piece of paper or a piece of tape over that, that magnet reduces its strength dramatically. Sort of an inverse square thing. Uh, it's actually possible to put like some heavy clear packing tape or contact paper over it that looks either clear or same texture as the, the magnet. And it reduces the door strength, uh, the holding strength about 90%. So it'll look like it's closed, but you can kick it open. Kind of interesting. Uh, there are some door strikes, maybe uh, not very well made, uh, non-ferrous materials. Any of those are, you know, possible to attack physically and destroy. But some of those may have the possibility of a, uh, you know, putting a strong magnet, like a hard drive magnet up to it and subverting it. Uh, might also be possible, if it's not well shielded, <coughs> to uh, induce a current in its magnetic uh, solenoid strong enough to open it. And then this is the classic one. Uh, some of you guys may have used this to get into a data center or somewhere when you lost your key or whatever. But the exit readers are almost always installed insecurely. Uh, there are some guidelines like keeping the, the push to exit button six feet away from the, the door uh, you know, jam and things like that. They're never followed most places. Maybe they can't be because it's a narrow hallway or whatever. Uh, but motion detectors can be fooled in a number of ways into opening, you can throw something through the door, you can inflate a mylar balloon under the door crack, uh, heat it up with a hairdryer, uh, you can uh, you know, access the buttons with a special tool bent out of some heavy wire. Uh, all of those are possibilities. And almost always the security policies are implemented in such a way as you want to prevent false alarms and not uh, you know, worry about absolute prevention of someone getting through the exit sensor. <clears throat> so, I thought it might be interesting to bring some hardware. Everyone likes to play show and tell, and uh, you know, maybe demo the system. We'll do that? Oh, good, good. Okay. All right. So, what we have here, uh, we have our version 2.11, that's the current version of the access control. And uh, this guy has uh, a couple of different sensors attached to it. Uh, here's a, a mortise, electric strike. And we can do things like uh, take an unauthorized card. We can swipe it. We just get a beep. We can take an authorized card. We can swipe it. And our little solenoid retract actually opens. Tells us it's open. This other one, this is a commercial HID reader. We can do that as well. We can activate it. We have something else kind of interesting. Uh, we have a cloner here. And we can clone one of these chips. This is a, a $50 eBay find. It literally has a coil of wire a couple of capacitors and maybe three chips on board, just a little AVR micro. And uh, if we take a, a card here, like this one that's not valid, we put it up to the coil, we read it, and then we take this rewritable tag, this is called a Q2, put that on there, it takes a little longer, but now it's cloned. Okay, you know, doesn't let us in, that's fine. Now if we take this valid key, which we can see it does let us in, we can read that, it takes just a second. We can clone it. And now we're in. <laughs> so 
I see there's really no reason this couldn't be installed, I don't know, let's say in a bus bench or, you know, Starbucks that day traders, uh, you know, like to hang out in or whatever. Uh, so, you know, if it can be read, if it can be read, I, I believe it can be cloned. You know, you should operate without assumption. Uh, and then this wiring, obviously along the way, this is just very small gauge, you know, 22 gauge wire, something like that. These aren't much pushing a lot of current. And it, it doesn't take a lot to, you know, you have to be very diligent about protecting this stuff. Kind of interesting. Uh, we don't have all the alarm outputs and everything hooked up to this, but uh, you can easily put four different zones of alarm uh, sensors in, and uh, you can expand that more with shift registers or resistors or, or different other ways of doing it. We do have four open pins for Ethernet or, or additional you know, sensor stuff. So just a little bit about that stuff. Uh, while we've been doing that, we also have been logging this. So this is our serial logging. Uh, it's really simple. You know, it's just uh, 57 kilobit uh, serial over USB. And we can send that into a Linux log host that tails the logs. We have some scripts uh, written up that are published. Uh, let you do things like pipe that to an alerting system uh, or email or SMS you when someone comes or goes or an alarm happens. Uh, really basic, but it uh, gives you the capability of directly internet monitoring or via cell phone or modem. Uh, what you have. And we have those four relays, only two of which are used for the door, so one of those can easily go into our alarm system as well and trigger the alarm monitoring company. So just the, the last thing, um, you know, again, we have uh, our physical exploits. Uh, we have the capability of, you know, potentially manipulating the wiring, doing horrible things with the data in transit, uh, you know, intercepting it, replaying it. We can do denial of service in a number of ways with these things. Uh, the contactless readers, in some ways, are better because we can put all of our reading behind the glass or inside our perimeter, but we have, you know, obviously new problems with being able to intercept it out of people's pockets and lunch boxes. <coughs> so if you uh, are curious about, you know, the, the engineering behind that and, you know, how you can predict how much range you can get and how much power, we, I actually was able to find one engineering textbook in RFID that's on here. Uh, it's our third entry down, this RFID handbook. It's translated from German, so it's a little bit weird. But uh, it gives you a lot of interesting info. And uh, I highly recommend this book, uh, Security Engineering by Ross Anderson. This really has everything from physical security to building secure embedded systems to uh, secure networking. Pretty neat stuff. And uh, the last book on the bottom, uh, there's some interesting uh, projects in there that you can implement as just a hobby hacker type uh, RFID toys. Uh, this guy, Amal Grafstra, actually implanted an EM4100 chip in his hand and wired up everything from his car to his house to open from that. So uh, there's someone who's been living on it. Pretty interesting. And uh, we have a few good links, too. The protocols for some of the stuff are published. Uh, the man in the middle attack that I mentioned, uh, that's Zach Franken, DEF CON 15, and Layer 1 2007. Uh, we have uh, you know, some of these documents from the CSAA, and uh, it's basically an ANSI working group, and some other stuff about smart card uh, you know, vulnerabilities, and uh, some other interesting stuff about just threat assessment in general. Uh, the last thing, we can download the code. Everything, Eagle files, the design, the Arduino source code, it's all right there, uh, that Google code link. And uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Logging keyed access. Logging keyed access. So, that's kind of problematic. The best you can do is log that the door opened a certain time. Some of the door hardware has a specific sensor inside that is tripped in the event of a key physically turning it. Uh, but that's, not some, that's something that depends on the mechanicals. Uh, you know, really, the only reliable thing is determining the state of the door or the state of a motion detector outside of it. We call that a request to exit if it's on the inside. And that generally is logged in most of the alarm systems. Uh, where they are, are actually correlating, you know, someone tripping that sensor with a, a request to exit. But they'll let you out regardless of whether you trip that sensor. Uh, anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, integrating with the, you know, the alarm system, have you found any, let's say in residential or commercial, any legal issues with that or any insurance issues or things with integrating with, like, say, ADT or something like that? Is there hardware even capable of being integrated with easily? 
to so, alert. So yeah, the easiest way to make that happen is to basically ask for a dry contact loop. Uh, most of the alarm vendors are okay with giving you an on-off contact that, you know, turning that on or breaking that connection will trip the alarm. People use that for things like, uh, let's say, monitoring their freezer if you have a grocery store. You know, you want the alarm to go off if the freezer quits working so that you don't lose $10,000 worth of seafood. Uh, and you can get it for, you know, like the, a sensor that de you know, detects if your basement is flooded. So generally, they're friendly with that. I don't think they care so much what's on the other end as long as it doesn't put high voltage in or screw up their system. That, that's what I found. It's a pretty common thing then. Yeah, it's a pretty common uh, thing you can request. Uh, the smaller systems may not have enough zones or, you know, the, the systems they give you for free, I wouldn't count on it. But any quality system installed by a pro should be ha able to do that. Most of them have a panic button control. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, you can do that too. The stupidest panic control and you just tie into that. Okay. I have one more question. Yeah. You talk about, you know, hacking some of the, like, this, uh, the keypad locks and stuff like that that are yeah. electronic. How, how successful has that been? Is that kind of, you know, hit and miss, or has it been repeated a few times? And you know? Well, so the, the one we're working on currently is the Hirsch Electronic Scramble Pad. Uh, those are available all over eBay, and they're cheap because they only operate with, guess what, Hirsch Electronic Space Stations. So we managed to find a rebuilt uh, bare circuit board that's really the only time you're going to have success, uh, I think, decoding one of those. That particular one had a, uh, a one-time programmable Intel 8051 CPU that with all the, f the fuses blown so you can't dump the ROM out of it. And it's dead silent until you hook up to this device that uh, sends a 300 hertz uh, pulsing square wave along with some wide pulses here and there for about five seconds and a little green light comes on telling you it's working. So not a secure protocol, but an obscure protocol. And something like a logic analyzer, uh, like the Analogic project from Nullspace, will, can help you decode that. Now, that one also is a little bit unfortunate to decode because uh, it's a 24 volt uh, plus 12 minus 12 signal. So we also need to uh, build some you know, voltage divider or, or some protection so that you don't blow up the logic analyzer. Uh, but that one we think is doable. Uh, some of the other ones that have a real you know, security challenge response protocol, those might not be so, so easy. But I think they're all within range of hackability. So does everyone want to put a you know hit system in in their in their apartment or their garage now? I mean, it's totally doable. It's it's within range. How much time do you spend on this? Uh, about half an hour total. <laughs> you gonna sell the uh, boards that you guys made? Good question. Yeah, uh, we actually uh, ordered about a dozen boards, and we have uh, spares and some kits available. So uh, we've been selling those at the 23B shop. Um, we'll be there you know Sunday. Uh, we, we'll have some. So we've been selling those for 100 bucks shipped, and we'll uh, we'll sell those for 80 bucks to anyone who attended uh, layer one. Awesome. <laughs> Anybody else? And that's just the board, right? Got it. No, no, that's the the board and all the components. The readers too? Yeah, no, oh, okay. uh, that would be the board, all the components to stuff the board. Right. Uh, no Arduino, no um, readers. Uh, the readers are available all over you know, eBay uh, from a lot of China vendors, Hong Kong, Taiwan. Uh, they're going to sell for between $20 and $50 each. Uh, there's a, actually a nice little one. Uh, it was in the version 1.0. That one will, will get you both a pin pad and an indoor reader, and it's like 16 bucks plus shipping. It's, it's dirt cheap. Uh, yes, we do. So there, uh, there's a wiki at the Google Code link. Nice. And that will show you, yeah, that reader right there, it's like 16 bucks if you see it, it's totally good. Uh, but the, uh, the wiki has a lot of stuff on wiring and debugging and building the thing. And uh, you know, we did find some other uh, you know, information that was interesting. Uh, all of the Import Asia readers work fine in our, you know, when we started deploying these, a couple other spaces have them. Uh, but some of the expensive commercial brands like HID didn't work reliably. We discovered they send faster pulses and might be a little bit under spec for what you know we had uh, we had thought we'd have. Uh, the, the standard isn't isn't always published, so we figured out there's some workarounds. You can put a couple of capacitors on there, and pretty much any reader works just fine. Really, anything that speaks Wigan 26. If you just do uh, an eBay search for Wigan or W26, you'll find loads of compatible readers and tokens. Yes? The, the cloner that you demonstrated, is oh. that the Proxmark project that you were talking about? That is not a Proxmark. This is a much dumber single purpose device. 
And uh, what this does is it lets you simply uh, clone EM4100, 4102 tags. Uh, they're one of the, the cheaper industrial tags that's available, you know, open standards and, and cheap. Uh, but there's no reason that couldn't be done. Uh, one other follow-on piece of research, I don't know if anyone reads Hackaday, I know it's one or two people, right? Uh, I don't know if anyone saw the duct tape RFID tag, uh, but they, someone took uh, just a small eight pin Atmel CPU, I think it's uh, an AVR85, and they attached a couple of capacitors and a loop of wire and made a, basically an RFID tag emulator. And we actually built one of these at the last minute uh, up at the shop last night and we opened the front door with it after we cloned another tag onto it. So that one will do both the HID cards and uh, the EM4100 because they're very similar. They just use a little bit different encoding. So there's no reason I think that couldn't be extended to other types of cards. So that's why you want the fence that have a pin as well. Exactly. Yeah, a pin as well is not a bad idea. A second factor, authentication with an, or uh, integration alarm system that has nothing to do with it is another option. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, surveillance, you know, cameras that log off site. All of those, you know, represent defense in depth. Yes? Would uh, your system integrate into, I know some uh, security camera DVRs have alarm uh, ports on them as well. So could we integrate it into something like that so that it would do the motion detecting as well? So if it has uh, like a port for a motion detector, uh, that would be a dry contact and that would be easy to, to integrate. Uh, if it doesn't, uh, there might be other ways of doing it through software. I think we're just about at time. Uh, if there's anything else. And uh, these slides should be available online, uh, you know, probably right after the conference. What's that? No reason you can't. I'm just lazy.